These cuttings are coming on fine. The problem is, I haven't finished my experiments and I need more plants, so I'll have to find the right way to produce more of them. But what's the best way? Cuttings? Seeds? I can feel an investigation coming on. It'll have to wait. Science line. What's going on out there? Stella, we've got a question for you. Yeah, look at these. This potato's sprouting like mad. Yeah, it looks like it's growing a new plant. But this apple's all mouldy and shriveled up. It's like it's rotting away. Yeah, it looks dead. Why are they different, Stella? I'm onto it. All living things are called organisms, and they all have one thing in common. They die. So they have to produce offspring to carry on the species. It's passing life on to the next generation. And they do this by a process called reproduction. Now, one way of reproducing is sexually. And this involves the joining of two special cells, one male and one female. And that's how most animals reproduce. In the case of humans, men have small cells called sperm, and women much larger cells called eggs. These two cells need to get together so the nuclei can fuse. It's called fertilization. When they do, a new life starts to grow. Animals are not the only sexual reproducers. Most types of plants do the same. But whereas most animals are either male or female, plants have both a male and a female part. But where do we find them? In here. Now this is the male part, or stamen, and it produces the male sex cell, pollen. The pollen is made in here, in the anther, on the top of this filament. And this is the female part, or carpal. And it produces the female sex cell, or egg, in the ovary. Now, in flowering plants, sexual reproduction takes place in two stages. The male pollen has to reach the female stigma. And this first part of the process is called pollination. Now, plants can pollinate themselves, and this is called self-pollination, but most of the time they don't. Mostly, the pollen travels from one plant to another and pollinates that, and this is called cross-pollination. But how does the pollen get from one flower to another? If the wind blows and the pollen is light enough, well, then the wind carries the pollen to the other plants. But more often, this is not the method used. Most plants pollinate by special delivery, as Howie is about to investigate. These flowers need to be pollinated, and time is short. Apple trees like this are only in flower for about one week a year. Once the blossom's gone, that's it. So my investigation is to find out how to pollinate not just these flowers, but all of these. This orchard is owned by Brian Neves. So what's involved in pollinating all these flowers? We have to get the pollen from one flower. And get it to another flower. I know that. But it's not just any flower. With apples, it has to go to another type of tree. Another type? So you have to take the pollen from this tree to pollinate flowers on this tree. On my left is a golden delicious tree. Pollen from its blossom has to go to the cox's blossom in the tree on my right. Only then will the apples be made. In this cox's orchard, in every group of cox's trees, there's a golden delicious tree. So I'll have to take the pollen from the Golden Delicious to all the coxes. But how? I could pollinate this orchard by hand. In the olden days, they used to use a cotton bud or a brush. Hmm. First, collect some pollen from the Golden Delicious flower. Now, time to pollinate. One done, a few more to go. I've been going for five minutes and I visited, well, nearly a hundred flowers. But that means to do the whole orchard would take um, longer than seven days. I think I need to call in the experts. 
Perry Beale is the man to help me, along with these. Hi, Perry. Is everything ready? Yes, they're all ready for you. But you better wear these. Aha. Uh -huh. Our pollinating experts are in there. And they're bees. <laughs> These bees can increase the number of flowers that are pollinated by 30%. We'll put them in the middle of the orchard so they don't wander into any other crops. Right, now for the moment of truth. Come on, bees. One hive of bees will pollinate an orchard the size of a football pitch in a day. Oh, what a glorious thing to be, a healthy grown-up bee, 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 away. Hang on, these bees have got to do some serious work. At least give them some decent music. A bee wants the nectar in the base of the flowers to make honey. On the way to get it, it brushes against the anthers and pollen sticks to the hairs on its body. Pollen? Bee. Just like that. Some pollen gets pushed into pollen sacks and is taken back to the hive. The hive? I wonder if there'll be any spare honey. Oh, maybe not. The flower is pollinated and the pollen lands here. But it still isn't fertilisation. The nucleus in the pollen still has to reach the nucleus in the egg, down here. Now the pollen grows a long tube, like a long straw, which funnels the nucleus to the egg. Seen under a microscope, these pollen grains are germinating. Pollen tubes are growing from the pollen grains. The male nucleus from the pollen passes down the tube on its way to the female egg cell where they will fuse and fertilization will be complete. After fertilization, the inside of the ovary becomes a seed. As you can see in this apple, so, from this seed, a new tree can grow. Right. So apples are the tree's offspring, produced by sexual reproduction. They drop off, rot into the ground, and the seeds grow into new trees. So why don't apple trees have lots of young trees that grow underneath them? That's obvious. The apples are picked and then taken away. But not always. What about other trees that grow wild? Yeah. So why don't plants grow all together in one clump? It's a good question. I think that's another one for Howie to investigate. Whenever you walk through a woodland or forest, you'll see seeds. They're everywhere. There are seeds in these. Look, pine cones. But I don't know if you've noticed this, I'm standing right underneath an oak tree. The nearest pine tree is probably that one over there. It's about 100 metres away. So that's my first clue. If seeds move away from their parent tree, they won't grow in a clump underneath. Hmm. Still need to find out more. Orion Hutton from the National Trust is a seed expert. Hi. Hi. So, how do seeds travel? There's four main methods of dispersal. There's by wind, by water, by animal, and mechanically, where the plant does it itself. Right. So now I know there are four ways a seed can be dispersed. By wind, animal, water, or by itself. So first, let's look at wind dispersal. These are sycamore seeds. The seed is this bit, and attached to it is a wing structure so the wind will carry it. Let's see. All right, you want to go and see what happened to them? Yeah. Oh, well, look, I think there's one over there. You can see that the helicopter structure helped this seed to travel quite a long way. Well, that's great for plants that can drop their seeds from a great height. But what about plants that are down on the ground? How do they use the wind? Well, take a look at this plant over here. It's a bit like a dandelion. It has small seeds with a parachute structure. Go on, have a blow. 
By moving away, seeds stand a better chance of survival, as there'll be less competition for resources from the soil and sunlight. Next, animal dispersal. Watch out! Looks like fox feces. What's he been eating? The fox had eaten berries with seeds in, moved away, then, well, only the seeds are left now. That's a good trick, isn't it? How far can animals take seeds like this? Oh, several miles, and if it was a bird eating berries, even farther. Now, have a look at your own socks. Well, there's loads there. Look, you've got burdock, agrimony, got some grass seeds here. So all these seeds have been carried by animals as they brush through the undergrowth. That's right. On the animal fur or people's clothing, it still gets the seed where it wants to go. Fantastic. What's next? Water dispersion. Water can carry the seeds many miles, like with this cotton. Some seeds, like this sea bean, can actually cross oceans. So that leaves self-dispersal. This is a squirting cucumber. And this is Himalayan balsam, pinging its seeds away. Those were quite dramatic examples. Some just bounce and roll like this pine cone. The seeds are in there. Right. Let's see how the different seeds have done. Self-dispersal could have got them a few metres. Wind dispersal could be hundreds of metres. Animal could be a few kilometres. Water could get them even further still. But the important thing is that each seed gets to where it needs to go. Ah, what's happening here? This looks like the start of a new plant. Now, not all plants and animals reproduce sexually. There is another way to produce offspring. So instead of cells from two different parents, one male, one female joining together, what if one cell in one parent divides into two, and then each half divides into two again? Four, and then continues dividing. Eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. And don't stop dividing until there is a complete new organism. Now this is asexual reproduction, when a plant or animal produces offspring from a part of its own body. The offspring are exactly the same as the parent, and they're called clones. I think Howie needs to investigate this bit of science in action. Thank you. A plentiful supply of food is essential if an animal's going to reproduce successfully. but. What if it hasn't got a mate? Well, it could do this. Oh, oh. Obviously, I can't really do this, but I know some animals that can. Come on, you. Time to investigate. Jack Cohen has some interesting freshwater animals. Hello, Jack. Hi, Harry. These hydra are magnificent. Yeah, there's just one lake in West Wales where you can pick up hydra as big as this. There's some, something going on here. How many hydra is that? One or two? Well, it's one hydra with a bud. And the bud is a clone of the parent. But in a couple of days, that bud will come off and then it'll be two hydra. So it can make the buds all by itself without mating? That's right. It's called asexual reproduction. And one hydra just produces lots of offspring like itself. Why do they do that? Well, it's a very neat trick. When conditions are right, they can multiply very, very rapidly. So what are these conditions? Well, some of the conditions are inside and some of them are outside. That's all the help I'm getting, isn't it? That's all the help you're getting, but you can work it out from that. Let's see. Outside conditions, light, there's plenty of that here. Then there's temperature. And what about those things? They're called Daphnia, tiny freshwater shrimps, but of course Hydra just call them dinner. Daphnia on the tentacle, Daphnia in the mouth. So I've got the external factors. They're temperature, light, and the amount of food available. 
Well, yes. Temperature not so important for these British hydro because the temperature of the lake goes up and down a lot. But food and light, desperately important. Excellent. But I still need more help on the internal factors. Got a handkerchief? Yeah, it's here in my pocket. Um, and where's your pocket? Well, it's in my jeans. Can't believe he used that gag. All right, let's sort this out. Genes are in every cell of every living thing. They're what carry the information that makes that thing the way it is. So the genes of a hydra will control how successful it is in its surroundings. So what does being successful in its surroundings mean? Well, if these bricks represent the genes of two different hydra, and that difference means that this hydra can get more food, perhaps because it's got longer tentacles, well, this is the hydra that's going to do better. And that means it's going to reproduce and make more copies of itself. And this one isn't. Right, I've got it. The internal part is the genes because they'll control how well a particular hydra does in its surroundings. Yep. And the better it does, the more offspring it'll produce. Absolutely. One thing remains, though. Why can't I reproduce like this? Because you're too complicated. A hydra, a simple creature, has a little group of cells which can make a new hydra in two days. But it takes nine months to make a human being. The bud on the right is a day old. The other, two days. Within a day, that bud will break off and become a clone, a new Hydra. I'm not sure I fancy Daphne or Dansack, but that asexual reproduction sounds like a laugh. Waiter! 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 Waiter. Waiter. Sexual or asexual reproduction? Well, this is asexual. So all I have to do is put the runners in soil. Now, these are in flower, and sexual reproducers need to cross-pollinate and collect seeds. And potatoes? Well, what do you think now? So that's why a potato looks like it's growing a new plant. It is. It's asexual reproduction. Yeah, and the apple is rotting away to release seeds made by sexual reproduction in the flower of the apple blossom. That's right. Now, here's one for you. These are earthworms. Now, if I was to cut one in two, what do you think would happen to each half? Die? Or would each half grow into a whole earthworm? Die. No, both would grow back. No. Oh, I don't know. What decides it? Do only plants asexually reproduce? No. How is hydro or animals? Right, so if the earthworm reproduced sexually, they'd probably die. But if they reproduce asexually, each half could grow into a whole earthworm again. 